Hello and welcome. This is the first video in a new series talking about writing custom functions in Excel. Uh, so the basic idea is if you ever, I don't know, Excel has a function for sum and for average, uh, but it doesn't have a function for a weighted average. You can do it with a bit of sum product and a bit of sum and a bit of you know manipulations of your own. But if you ever thought to yourself, wow, I wish Excel just had a function that did weighted averages, as of a couple of years ago, you have the ability to create that function yourself in a, in a pretty easy way. Um, so for today, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about how, that's you know, all the rest of the series is going to be talking about how, but for today, I want to give you a few examples of some kind of cool custom functions that other, other people have made and explain a little bit about the benefits of working with custom functions. And then starting from the next video, we'll talk a lot about how to go about building them. So let's start off. What is a custom function? I kind of touched on it with the, the weighted average example. It's, it is a function exactly like any of Excel's native functions, sum, average, etc., uh, that you write yourself and that you can use yourself, call it exactly the same as, as any other function. Uh, it, can, it can do anything that a native Excel function can uh, and lots of things that native Excel functions can't, uh, because that's the whole point. Um, so let's just make it a little more concrete and do some examples. So let's flip over to Excel. Start with a very simple example. Um, Excel recently added a text before function and a text after function. And the natural thing to think is, well, what if I want a text between function? What if I want the text between two delimiters? Uh, like here, for example, I want to extract whatever is between square brackets. Uh, Alan Murray wrote a nice, simple text between function. You give it the text you want, the starting delimiter, the ending delimiter, and it gives you the text that's in between those. So if you have something like this, alpha, beta, gamma with beta and square brackets, uh, it works also just as an aside, you know, a sort of real life use case, if you use the, uh, the cell function to return the file name, uh, it gives you something like this with your full file path, your file name in square brackets, and then the name of the sheet that you call it on. Uh, and so you can very easily use Alan's uh, text between function to, uh, to get just the name of the file. You just say text between file, uh, sorry, cell file name. Uh, to pull it out. Uh, I mentioned here Alan Murray and others because when I went to, uh, to go find the post where Alan had written about this, I searched text between on LinkedIn and realized that multiple other people, I mean, it's a kind of simple natural idea, multiple other people have, have written flavors of this as well. Some of them have more features, some of them are simple like Alan's. Uh, it's, it's all, the whole point of custom functions for me is it's whatever you need it to do. Um, so here's <clears throat> just a nice one quite different from uh, anything you would do with a native function uh, in Excel. This is one by Owen Price, and just called list all pairs. Um, so if you have a list of colors and a list of months, you just call list all pairs with the two lists, and it gives you every combination. So here's red and every month, here's orange and every month, yellow and every month, and so on. Uh, this is super helpful if you want to do a multidimensional uh, modeling, like you want to look at all combinations of store and product, all combinations of uh, you know, geography and industry, etc. Um, just to show you something completely different, because my last couple of examples are quite, you know, real world financial modeling y, uh, this is just like such an interesting idea uh, by Eric Ohm. Uh, it's called RGB to color name. So the arguments that you give it are uh, the, the color in terms of red, green, blue. So, like, if you, if you look at a color, go to more colors, you can see this is the RGB code. So it's 251 red, 226 green, 213 blue. And that combination defines like any color. Like as you move it around, you can see the different numbers. Uh, and so it's easy to say, you know, for this color, give me the red, green, blue. Eric wrote this very cool function that says, given a red, green, blue, and it's, it's based on like a table of, uh, you know, over a hundred uh, color names uh, with corresponding red, green, and blue colors, uh, you can say, what is the closest color to this? So this color is kind of antique white. This color is light green. This color is orchid. This color is fire brick. This color is midnight blue. Um, if some of those seem a little, uh, a little obscure to you, you could always, you know, run it with a shorter custom color list. Uh, but the, the idea is just, I, I love it. It's very kind of creative and different. Um, here's one that, uh, that I wrote and other people have written, uh, kind of variations of it, which is just, uh, a flexible timeline for a financial model. Uh, I use it all the time. Um, so I just give it two arguments, uh, the, the starting year, uh, or if I want, it can be uh, a starting 
date. So let's say if I wanted it to start on the 1st of March, then I can change that. Uh, but by default, it assumes you're looking at a year and it starts on the 1st of January. And then how many years? You could also tell it, uh, I want you know 12 months per period. And then it just gives you uh, a yearly timeline and then it drops. So it's got you know the, the period number, start date, end date, the year, the month number within the year. So one, two, three, up to 12, and then back to one when you get to 2025. The quarter number and the quarter name as in year dash Q quarter number. Uh, these are just kind of handy things to have if you want to aggregate your model up to say, okay, so by quarter, by year, whatever. Um, and yeah, like I said, you can tell it how many uh, months per period and it'll remove these if they're not relevant. Or you can also specifically tell it, I don't want the month start date. Uh, there are various different ways to customize the output, but you get the idea. Um, and the last one, this is the only one where I have not uh, pre-populated the function just because it's kind of cool to see it come together. This is one by Craig Hatmaker, who is a big Lambda evangelist, especially in the realm of financial modeling, um, and has written a whole suite of, uh, of great uh, custom functions related to that. So here's one that's for a series of loans. So let's say you're very spendy. <laughs> you're going to, uh, you're going to borrow $3 million to buy a first home and another million and a half to buy a second home. And you're going to borrow money to buy a car, borrow money to buy a boat. Uh, they have different rates for each of these loans, different terms. These terms are in months and different start dates. Uh, and we've got a model timeline here that we want to fit it into. So you can think about the, the time and effort it would take you to create the debt schedules for each of those and then uh, watch this and feel slightly ill. So we've got <clears throat> our table of principles, our, uh, our list, the table column of APRs, terms, and start date, and then we can link it to the timeline in the model. And it produces the whole schedule so you can see this, uh, this loan draws down uh, on the 1st of March, starts getting paid off, and then zoom along actually that's just control shift right arrow along uh, and you can see that 30 years later it gets repaid uh, and you can look at the other ones uh, so let's see this one for example uh, this is the second home loan gets paid off on the 1st of February uh, 49 which is again 50 years after this but it also has a couple of related functions uh, where you can dynamically generate the labels so that labels debt issuance, debt balance, interest, debt services, closing balance, debt repayment uh, for each item. So you can see this is the ones related to the first home, second home, car interest, boat. Uh, and there's also just a nice little, um, uh, some amortize uh, that just gives you the totals. So you can see, okay, yep, the first home loan got fully repaid, uh, 2 million of interest. So the total debt service uh, was over 5 million. Uh, this one fully repaid, this one fully repaid, and so on across. Uh, it's very, uh, very cool if you think about, you know, the development time to make something like this normally. So uh, that's some simple examples. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of working with custom functions. Number one is just easier, faster to use. So like, I think the text between is a great example of this one, right? Like text between is just a combination of text before and text after. You take the text before the ending delimiter, then within that you take the text after the starting delimiter. If you know how to use text before and text after, it'll take you 10 seconds to write that, but it'll take you two seconds to write it with text between. <clears throat> it's just ease of use. Similarly, like that timeline that I showed you, you know, it's, it's not a challenging task to make a timeline in a financial model, but it's so, it's so kind of boilerplate. It's so, such grunt work that there's very little reward if you build, you know, 50 models over a period of time. There's very little reward in building 50 new timelines each time you do that. And so just having a function that, that kind of speeds that up is a big value add, but there's a lot more than that. So second thing is consistency and error reduction. So again, think about the, the amortization model example. If, um, if you build each of those four debt schedules separately, and I don't know, let's say you have some, some wobble with the PMT function in some place, because it's a little fidgety, whatever. There are lots of ways that models go wrong. Then you can end up with an inconsistent model logic between your different debt schedules, even though they're all supposed to be operating exactly the same. Um, similarly, like if you've if you've written your custom function that builds a debt schedule like that, and then you build you know ten other models over the course of the coming couple of months or whatever, um, then you can just kind of grab grab that reusable thing and know that your logic is going to be exactly consistent with how it was before. So that's a big plus. Um, Second thing is, I 
I guess I mentioned this already, that like you can apply it to other files of yours. You can also share it across teams. So let's say that there is, uh, I don't know, you're modeling, uh, you're modeling companies in a jurisdiction that has a particularly complicated uh, tax rule. Um, so there's, I don't know, maybe there's all kinds of deductions and maybe there's, uh, you know, a weird kind of schedule of progressive rates and maybe there's other things. <clears throat> rather than everybody kind of building that logic up themselves individually, you can have one person write a custom function that calculates the tax given the various inputs, and then just share that with the rest of the team. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more later about, there's a, there's a whole infrastructure around being able to share these in nice ways, like through, uh, through GitHub and gists and that kind of thing. Um, but for now, all you need to think about is it allows you to share that logic across files and teams. This is one that I think is less immediately obvious, which is it allows you to change the logic throughout a model from one place. And so here's the way I think about it. Today, if somebody said to you, oh, um, we've, we've been building this model uh, based on you know, an, an investment in country X based on a 24% tax rate, uh, but they've just passed a new law and the tax rate is gonna be 27% uh, starting from you know, before the period we make our investment. If you said to that person, okay, no problem, I'll just have to go into all the tax calculations and in each individual cell change 24% to 27%, they would be horrified, and rightly so, because doing it that way, A, is much slower compared to if you just have one assumption cell that has the tax rate or you know, maybe a, a table of you know, tax rates by effective date or whatever it is, uh, where you can change it in one place. It's much slower to change it, and which to my mind is actually the, the more important thing, it's riskier and more error prone because if you change the tax rate in 98 of the 100 cells that feature the tax rate, if you've got it hard coded in every cell, then your model isn't just slow to update, it's actually internally inconsistent and wrong, and that's a big problem. But if instead of the tax rate changing, something about the logic of the tax changes, so let's say, for example, um, you know, instead of being able to deduct 100% of interest payments, you can only deduct interest payments up to 35% of EBITDA is one that I've, I've heard of in some jurisdictions. Um, now the person who tells you that, you tell them, oh, sure, I'll just have to go into the tax schedule and every cell that calculates tax, I'll just change the formula. And today, they probably wouldn't feel so horrified about that because that's kind of the natural limitations of Excel. If you calculate tax in 50 places and you want to change not just a number assumption, but the actual logic of that, then you have to go through and change it in 50 places. But my expectation is that say 10 years from now, if you told someone, oh yeah, I'll just go change that logic in all of the, you know, 50, 100 cells it appears in in the model, they would be as horrified as if you told them you're going to manually change hard-coded uh, tax rates in every place it appears today. Because if you write that complicated tax logic as a custom function, then that custom function just sits in your workbook and there is one place that you can centrally change it exactly like there's one place that you can centrally change the one number that is the tax rate. And that will flow through to the entire model. And that in terms of speed to update and in terms of avoiding the risk of inconsistency because you changed it in most of the places, but you forgot that there's one other tax schedule over here or whatever, uh, that is a much more reliable way to make an update. So that, that one to me is actually one of the biggest things. I think it's not that widely used at the moment, but uh, like I said, I, I think in 10 years, if you tell someone, oh, I, I need to go and change formulas in five, five different places and make sure I copy it across the row because there's a new rule for how you do accounting depreciation for this kind of asset starting from next year, it, it would be horrifying. Uh, so that's that's another thing, and then the last thing, this is uh, this is one that uh, Craig Hatmaker, who I mentioned earlier, is a big fan of. It allows you to separate the developer from the user. So in other words, today for the most part, if you want to build a financial model, you you build your own financial model, or you know you might hire someone to do it for you. But there's a, a sort of in between world where um, someone prepares functions for you that might be, you know, like that amortization schedule function where, you know, you've got a, a basic Excel user that would not be able to do the kind of, you know, advanced, um, like 
PMT calculations and, and all of that stuff, but would be able to kind of follow simple instructions that say to create an amortization schedule type equals amortize lambda and then point it here, 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 and here, and then hit enter. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole world, and again, this, this links into the ideas around, like Craig's big thing is the, the parallel with, in the computer science world, component-based software engineering. The idea that if you build your program out of a series of components that have been individually tested, it can give you a lot more comfort about the reliability of the program as a whole than just writing the entire thing from scratch. And so if you have, you know, developed and then really well tested functions that allow you to kind of build a whole amortization schedule, build a whole depreciation schedule, build a, an income statement from a variety of, you know, connected inputs and whatever, then you can build your model much more quickly, but also much more reliably uh, than, than otherwise. Anyway, uh, just because I know that a certain portion of the people watching my channel like to be quite technically correct, I described the ability to write custom functions as a new thing. Uh, it's not strictly a new thing because you've been able to write custom functions in VBA for many years, but there are a few important differences. Um, to my mind, the, the two big ones are, one, uh, the limitations of VBA in terms of shareability. By, by default, in almost any uh, kind of corporate environment that you work in, uh, a file that arrives with macros in it, the macros will be disabled. And my, you know, if it comes over the internet, that's considered extra scary by Microsoft. And you have to really, you can't just open the file up and say, yeah, I'm okay with it. You have to close it down again, go and change the settings, open it up again. It's, it's a whole palava to get a file to work with VBA. And if someone opens your file with VBA disabled, possibly without even thinking about the fact that VBA is disabled, uh, and your model working relies on a custom function that's written in VBA, that's going to be a problem. But the second thing is that custom functions written in the grid, in the way that I will start showing you from the next video, are massively easier for someone who already knows Excel and knows kind of in-grid formulas to learn to write versus learning VBA. Um, if you want to write something very basic, then it's probably fine to do it in VBA anyway. But if you want to write something that can take advantage of, you know, modern Excel dynamic arrays that can, you know, expand like that amortization schedule of Craig's and things like that, that requires some pretty advanced VBA if you want to do it to the extent that you can do it at all. And it's like that, that advanced knowledge is, is sort of completely orthogonal to your advanced formula writing knowledge. If you're a good formula writer, you can much more easily turn into a good custom function writer than you can turn into an advanced VBA developer. So that's the quick aside about uh, yes, I know, but still. Uh, so briefly, what's next? Uh, like I said, the, the, my main aim here is just to, now that I've shown you why, I'm going to show you how. Uh, how you write a custom function in Excel, we're going to go like from the very, 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 very basics, like a function of, of A and B that says, I don't know, add A to B, super simple, all the way through to like crazy advanced stuff like that amortization schedule and, and other things. Um, part of the motivation for this was I've been promising for a while, I wrote a series of custom functions that I use in the Excel esports competitions, things like you know, converting dice into numbers or solving mazes, uh, again, ranging from very simple to very advanced. And I've been promising to share those and I realized that I don't really want to share them until I can also share the, the kind of knowledge to understand them and, and to kind of customize them to yourselves and whatever. So as part of this, I'm also going to be sharing those and a number of the other esports competitors uh, who who use lambdas have also said they're happy to share theirs and you know some of them have expressed an interest that i'm gonna you know we're, we're gonna have like a live uh, chat on the channel to talk about how they use them and that kind of thing um so th this is going to be i don't know how long it's going to take because <laughs> my kids are about to get off school and my free time is about to disappear um but at some point over the next weeks or months this series will will continue and expand and uh we'll be covering everything you need to know about writing custom functions but that's all I've got for today, so thanks for watching and see you next time.